Septuagint versus Masoretic. This is the only ministry on the planet Earth where we look at the uh, Septuagint and the Masoretic text side by side, line by line, from cover to cover, from Genesis to Malachi, and we plan to look at the New Testament as well. So without further ado, uh, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 14, and the title of this video is What are the Pygarg and the Camel Lopard? What animals are they? So there are 29 verses in this chapter, <clears throat> beginning in verse 4. We see the first difference. It's actually not a difference. It's more of uh, this is a, a revisitation of Leviticus 11. So there might be a lot of repetition here, but it is this. these laws are so important regarding what is permissible and what is forbidden to eat that it's repeated twice. Leviticus 11 and now here. In Deuteronomy 14. We have a significant difference in verse 4. It's talking about uh, the calf of the herd, the lamb of the sheep, and the kid of the goats. These are all the young of these uh, respective species. On the other hand, the Masoretic just lists them as ox, sheep, and goat. Now, it is lawful to eat, whether it's the young or the mature of these uh, species. But it's interesting, anyhow, that it does mention uh, the young specifically. I'm not sure why. So that is a big question mark for me. Uh, please comment and share your thoughts on why that is. I'll comment down below in the comment section. Verse 5, uh, we have an addition of fallow deer. Now, fallow deer is just simply a type of deer. And we get into this question of a pie garg. It is mentioned in both uh, versions. So I looked it up. Uh, there are three different possibilities, um, actually two. A pygarg is, could be a type of roe deer, which is found in Siberia. Uh, or it is a type of an antelope called the adax, which is found in the Middle East. Uh, so I come to the conclusion that it is the adax because uh, again, this book, the Torah, the Tanakh, Septuagint, they were not based in Middle Eastern, uh, in European culture, they were based in the Middle East. Uh, so let's look at the Siberian roe deer. So this is a possibility, but uh, in my opinion, I'm going to rule that out. So that's a Siberian ro roe deer found in the mountains of Tibet, Asia, Siberia, Mongolia, okay? And now we're going to look at the Adax, which again is found in the Middle East. And then I have a link showing uh, that. So th this is native to the Sahara Desert. Uh, it is a type of antelope. Um, I'm trying to look at the distribution. Okay, so it is found in... Uh, Middle Eastern areas, in Africa and the Middle East. It was known by the Egyptians. Uh, we can see different colors and variations. It does resemble the animal used for, a, I think a kudu it's called, the one that they use for a shofar. It's found in Morocco as well. Maybe it's just the national park. Okay, just looking at other you know, distribution. So it is found in uh, deserts, de desert regions, found in the region of Africa, west of the Nile Valley. So again, very close to Israel, the geographic location of Israel, found in uh, Algeria, Libya, and I'm going to try to pronounce that, word, uh, that name there, Chad, and the Air Mountains, Mauritania, Sudan, Western Sahara, Morocco, Tunisia. And then there's a post here uh, showing there's a preserve in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem Zoo. Um, it says Bible Land Preserve. Uh, Jerusalem Zoo, the Adax or the Pygarg of Deuteronomy 14.5. 
the Yemenite Jews made the shofar from its horn. Interesting. So there you go. That, that might be just further proof that this is the, uh, this is indeed the pygarg. Okay, so I think we are going to close that case. And continue on with our reading. Uh, we have the addition of the wild ox added in the Masoretic. We have an interesting animal, another one uh, that is a mis mystery to most, called a camel lopard. What is a camel lopard? When I looked it up, it appears to be, drum roll please, it is defined as a camel looking animal. It is the giraffe. It is called so because it has a resemblance in form to a camel, but because of its spotted coloration, uh, they combine that name with a leopard. So that's what a camelopard is, a giraffe. So it is lawful, uh, unlawful, I should say, to eat a giraffe. Interesting, because for the longest time, um, I believed we could eat giraffe. So it is actually unclean after all this time, going by that, uh, going by the Septuagint, it is now unclean. Oh no, <laughs> let me just rewind. You're allowed to eat it. Okay, you're allowed to eat the giraffe. So I stand corrected. I just corrected myself. Uh, this is animals you shall eat. Okay, we're not there yet as in terms of uh, animals we should not be eating. And the chamois in the, uh, the Masoretic text talks about a chamois. So let's look at what that is. I'm not sure where the chamois go here. I might have to write it down again. Oh, here it is. So it's saying a chamois, which is an addition. Clearly, it's just an addition. It is a goat antelope, uh, native to Europe, but also found in Turkey. So what is a goat antelope? Is it really? says here, a species of goat antelope. Wow, so it's like a hybrid. That's an interesting animal. So it's saying we can eat this. I have no qualms about that, not that I wanna eat this, but it seems to make sense that this would be clean uh, because most likely it does chew the cud and uh, divide the hoof as well. So there's gonna be a lot of browsing a lot of uh, picture showing. Um, so let me just show you more pictures of this animal. And where is it distributed? Seems to be distributed in Europe. Uh, so not so much in the Middle East. I mean, there seems to be a little bit of areas there. Um, here it is, Caucasus, so found in Europe. Turkey and the Caucasus. So it, it could be this, um, but it just not, is not mentioned in the Septuagint, so I don't accept it. But because uh, it is mentioned in living in these areas, uh, it's interesting that, you know, that this will be, this is permitted to be consumed as meat. Okay, let's move on. This might be a long video on retrospect. So Let's see, uh, the next verse talks about a rabbit versus a coney. Uh, so this beginning in verse seven, these are animals we should not be eating. Uh, rabbit is mentioned and a coney, I believe a coney is uh, a synonym for rabbit. And it's a type of rabbit, actually it's a large rabbit, isn't it? Uh, verse nine disqualifies all shellfish, all reptiles, all amphibians uh, that live in the water, I should say, crustaceans, non-vertebral vertebral life forms like jellyfish and so on. So these are all the creatures that live in the water. They need to have, must have fins and scales if we're going to be eating them for food. Um, and then moving on to verse 12. These are all the unclean birds listed here. Uh, starting with the ossophrage, or ossophrage 
it is a bearded vulture. Okay, so that's what it looks like there. Basically looks like a vulture. Um, there you go, some pictures of it. Okay, that's not what it is, just ignore those. <laughs> those are nightmarish pictures, so. Okay, and it does mention it in both uh, translations. I noticed uh, it says sea eagle here, but uh, that just might be an osprey. I believe that's what it is. Uh, so it does sound a little, little redundant, even in the Septuagint where it says sea eagle. Uh, or you could just say eagles all across the board and just cover uh, a lot of species, a lot of uh, breeds. Um, verse 13 talks about a gleed in the Masoretic, which is a type of kite. So it does cover that when it says the kite and the like to it. Uh, a kite looks like a, uh, it is a bird of prey. It doesn't look like one, it is one. And uh, we can see the, uh, sp the family Falconidae was divided into five uh, divisions by Vigors in 1824. We'll look at a picture of, there you go, a kite. It looks like a small hawk or a small, not really an eagle, more like a small hawk in my opinion. But anyway, it is a bird of prey. That's the important thing to remember there. Um, verse 14, uh, we have an addition. It's not so much an addition, but uh, Raven was simply moved to verse 17. So we'll move, move on from that. So verse 15 uh, adds the word cuckoo or cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> we may have different birds that we can eat then. Uh, perhaps a cuckoo is actually a clean bird uh, since it was added there. And the nighthawk was added as well, which is simply redundancy. The sparrow was mentioned in the, uh, in the Septuagint, so that was omitted, meaning perhaps a sparrow is unclean. The simu was omitted as well, which is a common gull. Think of seagulls and other gull uh, birds. Uh, that would be unclean. And we know seagulls eat everything. Uh, so they are definitely unclean. But they are not listed in, uh, in Deuteronomy 14 in the Masoretic. Verse 16, we have an addition of little owl and great owl, which again are redundancies because it just says owl in the Septuagint and just covers all of the variations. We have heron in both uh, versions. A heron is a S-shaped necked bird, uh, and their necks coil back when in flight. Let's take a look at some images here. So that looks like a crane to me, but a heron has a uh, S-coiled neck. Let's take a look at the, the picture just to uh, specify, just to there you see the, the neck coils when it is in flight. So that's how you know the difference. And they have an S-shaped neck. Uh, cranes have shorter necks than herons uh, and shorter bills as well. And when cranes fly, they usually fly with their necks, if not straight out, semi-extended and not coiled back like we see here with the heron. So this is a bit of an ornithology uh, video today, kind of becoming a bird expert from this, all this research I've done for this chapter. And then we have storks. I think everyone knows what those look like. Just think of the cartoon stork with the baby. Verse 17, uh, we have an addition of the gyre or jeer eagle, which is a redundancy again. We can list every type of eagle, uh, falcon, hawk, and it would take up multiple chapters if we did that. So just be efficient with words. And for the most part, the Septuagint is efficient. We have the cormorant, which is identified in both translations. Uh, cormorant is a sea raven. Their bills are long. Uh, their bills are thin and sharply hooked. Let's just look at a picture of that. There you go, it's a cormorant. And it's also a, if you're a fan of it, Pokemon. It's also a Pokemon as well. 
So there's a cormorant right there, which does look very much like the, the Pokemon animal or creature. Let's try to zoom in there. Okay, it's not letting us zoom in. There it is. So that's a cormorant. So it's not, it isn't duck build. It does have a long, thin, sharply hooked bill. Uh, and some species of cormorant or some types of cormorant do um, have a hook shaped bill. Next is the hoopoe. It is a colorful bird, and we'll show you a picture of that one as well. We all know what a raven looks like. It's like a fat crow or a large crow. There's a hoopoe. And they're found all over the Middle East. You can see its distribution of all the different species of hoopoe all over uh, the Middle East and in parts of Africa and even in Asia as well. So they're colorful, colorful birds. It's an interesting inclusion that uh, yeah includes this bird uh, to not be consumed. And I believe that's, oh, that's only in the Septuagint. Okay, so the hoopoe is, I believe it, it is clean in the Masoretic, but it is unclean in the, uh, in the Septuagint. So I'm going to write here, it was omitted. So these are pretty, these are pretty significant differences. You can't eat these birds according to the Septuagint. Uh, next, we have an addition of the lapwing. Uh, lapwing was added to the Masoretic in verse 18. So some of these birds um, are found in the Middle East. It does not appear to be similar to other unclean birds. Um, uh, with sharp beaks, such as birds of prey and such. So let's look at the lapwing. Not, uh, so it is distributed in the Middle East, this bird. Again, it does not appear to be similar to other unclean birds that we mentioned, the falcon uh, family, the storks and herons and such. So this might be a clean bird since it was added to the original text. Let's just take a closer look at it and see if we can examine just from its characteristics, does it appear to be a similar in structure to the, no, it looks like a pigeon. So I'm not sure this should really be an unclean bird. But uh, again, this is in the Masoretic text, not in the Septuagint. So we have different birds listed as clean and unclean. So these are significant differences. We could be breaking the law. We can be breaking Torah and not really know it, depending on what version of the Bible you're using. Okay, next is uh, the diver. Um, so the diver is not mentioned. Again, it's omitted. This one is omitted in the uh, Masoretic text as well. And I looked up what a diver is. It is known as a loon in North America. Uh, it has a spear-shaped bill. We know what loons look like. Most of us do, especially those who live in Canada. We know what lo loons look like there. So that's a loon, it has a distinct call, and that is uh, identified as unclean according to the Septuagint. Next is a red bill. Uh, red bill, this one is a big question mark because we have what could be three different species of birds. We have the corn bill, which looks like a, a toucan, which is found in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so let's look at that first. So that's the red-billed hornbill. This one is a big question mark. I'm not sure which one it is, to be honest, because they are found, I believe all three are found in or near the Middle East and, and Africa. Next is the red-billed oxpecker, which is also found in sub-Saharan Africa. We'll look at that. The red-billed oxpecker. So this is a a lot of ornithology going on in this video, but it's very important. 
especially if you want to be eating birds and not breaking Torah. So this is what that looks like. This looks like a clean bird to me. <laughs> Doesn't look like one of those fearsome, uh, you know, storks and birds of prey and so on. Pointy, pointy billed birds. No, it looks rather not harmless, but you know, not as fearsome as those other birds. So it might not be this one, the oxpecker, uh, which usually I think it eats all the parasites and bugs, insects from the um, backs of other animals. So there you go. That's the the oxpecker. There you go. It's eating from the ear of a an antelope type creature. Okay, uh, next is the red-billed tropic bird. That is another possibility. This one, I have a strong suspicion it is this one. It doesn't seem to be the oxpecker. Could be the red-billed hornbill, but this one makes the strongest uh, argument to being the one. Uh, we can see it is distributed in this area. It looks like the near the Middle East. So this could very well be that. Uh, this animal. Um, it is a tropic bird, so it does frequent oceans, so it gets around. Uh, it has been some of the sub subspecies of this bird is in the waters off the Middle East in the Indian Ocean, so it very well might be this one. And we can see what they eat. Uh, let's look at their diet. They eat a very unclean uh, animals not just fish, but squid. They are known to eat squid. They, they, they do like to eat that, which is an unclean creature. Usually, not all the time, but when an animal consumes other unclean animals, they tend to be unclean. Kind of a rule of thumb, but it, it isn't uh, all across the board. Okay. Middle Eastern lapwing. I looked that up just to uh, do my due diligence here. So here's some pictures of a lap wing. Uh, we looked at that earlier. So I'm going to just close this tab and then finish up the rest of this chapter. And then obviously the bat. Yeah, the bat looks like a flying mouse. So yeah, that is a <laughs> definitely unclean. Uh, verse 21 is an interesting law. It says here, you shall eat nothing that dies of itself talking to ancient Israel, but it shall be given to the traveler in your cities, those who are staying temporarily, he shall eat it, or you shall sell it to a stranger, an immigrant, because you, Israel, are a holy people. So it, it, this is interesting to me because uh, this is permissible to be eaten only by the sojourner and the stranger. So meaning this is not wasted, you're not wasting uh, this meat which is interesting to me. I uh, wonder why that is so, but uh, I mean, Yah explains it's because you are uh, holy, you're set apart to Yah, so you shall not do this, but those people who are not, they can't. So there's an exception for them. So uh, all these animals listed, uh, there's no exceptions for other people that they can eat You know what is unclean. It's saying those that are clean, that dies of itself. So that's the uh, that's the caveat here. That's the the uh, spe specific instruction. Uh, next, we have verse twenty two. It says, "You shall tithe a tenth." Versus, "You shall truly tithe all the increase." Uh, okay. We have an omission of the word fruit. Verse twenty four. We have a difference of because the place is far from you versus uh, if the place be too far. But in any case, the place is too far. Or I should say when. It says when. Uh, it just says if. Let's hold on a second. Let me rewind here. It's because the place is far from you. But here it says uh, if the place be too far from you. Okay. Okay, I, that actually was not the difference. It's the second because. Uh, it says, because Yah will bless you versus. Uh, 
of when. So that's the one, it's the second because, let me just put here. So that was a little confusing. So it is the second because. And then verse 25, uh, I asked the question here, what is the place Yah chose? Because it says here, specific to, uh, you shall go to the place which Yah, your Elohim, shall choose. Uh, what is that place? Well, at this time in history, the temple was not built. So they didn't have a temple and they weren't in the land of Jerusalem. They weren't in the promised land yet. They were still traveling. Um, and they haven't had a king or anything like that yet. Uh, all they had was the tabernacle, the traveling tabernacle. So uh, it, was not it was not identified in this point of history. Uh, they were a nomadic people, the Israelites. So they relied on waiting on Yah to guide them to the places, the destinations they would travel to. Um, so that's, I believe that's how you can interpret this because uh, in this time, in this point of time in history, they had to wait to see where uh, Yah will, will choose to either put his name or, or set up camp and tell them this is where we're staying for now. But now we know, uh, I think without a shadow of a doubt, where he's placed his name, that's uh, geographically in the city of Jerusalem. That's where the temple should be built. That's where we should go to keep the feast three times a year and all your meals appear before him. Okay, uh, so that's all for that verse. Verse 26, uh, this is an interesting verse. Uh, whatsoever your soul, your soul shall desire. A lot of people use this verse to justify uh, buying uh, very large, expensive items during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, so this is my opinion that this is talking about referring to only things that are to be eaten and, and to drink during the Feast of Tabernacles. This does not include major purchases of luxury items you know, extravagance, like buying a new car, buying clothing, non-edibles, uh, and buying a house. So <laughs> perhaps, for, for instance, we have online uh, e-commerce, so people could justify and say, okay, I'm at the feast, I'm going to make a large purchase and buy a house online or a, a property or land or something like that. I don't believe that's what it's talking about. I believe it is, in my opinion, again, it's my opinion, uh, things that we should be eating and consuming and sharing with others during the Sukkot, the holy uh, set apart, uh, high holy days. Verse 27, there's an addition of, and you shall not forsake him, which in my opinion is a given. It's self-evident because the Levite is to be included in the items that are being shared uh, in terms of eating and drinking. And verse 28, it says fruits versus increase. And then last difference, a continuous difference is cities versus gates. That's all for this uh, chapter of Deuteronomy 14. Um, there's a lot of information here. I, this might even warrant a second listen. That's how uh, detail-oriented this is. Or that's how much information is put into this chapter. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope this video was helpful to you. I noticed an increase in views lately, so I, I hope to uh, maintain consistency with the quality of the videos and the presentation and sound quality and so forth and efficiency with time. So uh, until next time, God bless you and make your way prosperous, Maranatha, and tune in to the Septuagint versus Masoretic. Next episode will be Deuteronomy chapter 15.